Of course, peace and democracy are connected, but not in the way people like to say, we must wage war to expand democracy. Peace is neglected in that approach. You are absolutely right, and that is one of the misconceptions that exist today. I primarily believe that people simply have it too good. They always want more. This mentality is ruining the world, democracy, and ultimately ourselves. Hello everyone. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies again. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with an Austrian colleague, the philosopher Professor Dr. Erwin Bader from the University of Vienna. Professor Bader has taught and researched various topics in philosophy for many years, especially in the fields of political philosophy, ethics, and philosophy of religion. Today we want to talk about the political situation in Europe and the role of neutral Austria in it. This naturally raises the question of whether Austria will follow the same path as Finland and Sweden or not. Professor Bader, welcome. Professor Bader, herzlich willkommen. Hello. Uh, Professor Bader, vielen Dank, dass Sie sich die Zeit nehmen heute. Den Professor Bader, thank you for taking the time today. I've been wanting to do an episode about Austria for a long time, particularly on the question of neutrality. I'm Swiss, and our two countries are connected by neutrality. You are a philosopher, and there isn't a specific philosophy of neutrality. But within political philosophy, where would you place the topic of neutrality? Neutrality is firstly a general concept. For example, a judge who behaves neutrally towards the prosecution and the defense, or in a dispute when someone stays out of the conflict. That is actually impartiality or non-partisanship. This is identical to neutrality, I would say. That's always the first point. Secondly, neutrality is of course a political term and in this sense a legal term, specifically a concept of international law. From an Austrian perspective, it is mostly argued that neutrality is primarily a constitutional issue. But most states that are neutral, and also permanently neutral, do not have their own legal basis in the Constitution. This is a peculiarity that Austria has. I don't know if this question has been answered in this way initially. Yes, definitely. The generality of the term is a problem that we have to deal with repeatedly because it is not clear-cut. Of course it has a meaning, as you say, but it can also be filled with a lot of content. We have to do this repeatedly in the political process. Austria changed its neutrality from 1955. Officially, it was said that we were striving for neutrality, like Switzerland, in the famous Moscow Memorandum signed with the Soviets. But from 1955, Austria immediately pursued a different foreign policy than Switzerland. Switzerland only joined the UN in 2002, while Austria did so in November 1955, in the same year. From then on, Austrian neutrality was also integrated into the European context. How would you see Austria's role within Europe, first during the Cold War and then after 1991 in the new Europe? I would like to go further back. Austria and Switzerland share a commonality in that Swiss neutrality was decided at the Congress of Vienna and internationally recognized. This shows a certain connection of Swiss neutrality with Vienna. Additionally, I wanted to say that neutrality has a history that goes back even before the resolution of October 26, 1955, namely to the collapse of the monarchy. Even before the collapse of the monarchy, the last prime minister of the Austrian half of the empire wanted to pursue a policy of neutrality. However, this did not work because it was not recognized by the other states. When the state was then newly founded under the name German Austria, 
It was clear from the beginning that Austria was not considered permanently neutral in the strict sense of international law, but rather quasi-neutral. This means that, unlike simple neutrality, there was also an international legal obligation. And this international legal obligation was also the reason why a customs union between Austria and Germany was not permitted under international law. A neutral state could not, according to the prevailing view at the time, enter into a customs union with another state. The desire for Austria to join was denied with reference to its quasi-neutrality. This is not emphasized as much in Austrian historical consideration today as it was in the past. Great legal scholars like Veroster and Ferdros have described and assessed this in great detail. This means that Austrian neutrality has a history that predates the time of its adoption. This is also the reason why Austria proposed to adopt the Moscow Memorandum or the law. There is not much contained in this law. Neutrality and the independence of the state form a unity in this law. That's what I wanted to say about it. Swiss neutrality is also related to the unity of the state. There were disputes with France that had to be settled. At the same time, it was promised not to pursue an expansive policy to avoid making Switzerland larger than it already was. This means that there was a guarantee from both sides that this state is independent in this form and should remain so. This was also the case in Austria. During the Cold War, this played an important role. Due to this status of neutrality, Austria had an international reputation as a bridge builder between the two blocs. This status was particularly important and very fruitful during the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, because at that time there was indeed the danger of a nuclear war. Through Austrian mediation between Russia and the USA and the talks that took place, the danger of a conflict could be averted. This was a positive aspect of Austrian neutrality. It served the purpose of international peacekeeping, not only theoretically, but also practically in history. Neutrality is an institution of international law with an international purpose. It allows states that are at war to come together on neutral ground and negotiate to establish peace. Even before a war breaks out, disputes can be carried out and resolved on neutral ground to maintain peace. That is absolutely correct. Neutrality also serves the purpose of containing wars. Neutral states do not participate in wars and thus do not contribute to their expansion. They are the opposite of an alliance, which in 1914 led to a conflagration. There are various levels of peace contexts with neutrality. If you look at the discussion today, in the year 2024, you see how formerly neutral Europe, especially Sweden and Finland, has moved into NATO. The political discourse in Central Europe is changing. Do you feel that Austrian neutrality will survive this moment of new bloc formation? Or could it fall victim to political pressure? The danger has existed for a long time. When Chancellor Schüssel was in office, this discussion already took place. Austria should no longer remain neutral. Neutrality was like Mozart Kugeln, something that could be discarded and eliminated. Those were peculiar terms. At that time, I wrote an open letter to Chancellor Schüssel, and it apparently bore fruit. He should not go down in history as the chancellor who abandoned Austrian neutrality, which was decided for all time. The law explicitly states that it applies for the future.
wo es in aller Zukunft auch wird. This is the only law in Austria, to my knowledge, that literally states it applies for all future. Apart from the concept of permanent neutrality, which not only concerns the future, but also the continuation, regardless of whether a state of war exists or not. This law should not be repealed without a real necessity that could not have been managed otherwise. There was no existential necessity at that time, and there is none today. If the state repeals a law that is binding for all time without a valid reason, then the state or the person doing so becomes untrustworthy. Then the contractual commitment to NATO or other alliances will also have to be questioned. They may join today, but next time they might do the opposite, just like it was with neutrality. If a state is neutral and stops being neutral, it becomes untrustworthy and loses prestige. It also becomes a target, even more so than a state that has always been in NATO, because that represents a change. We see this as a great risk and a significant danger associated with it. Yes, for me, the question at the moment is why countries that have long benefited from a policy of neutrality, like Finland and Sweden, are changing their stance. Sweden was successfully neutral for 200 years. The difference is that the Swedes did not enshrine neutrality in their constitution. They only had it as a foreign policy credo. The Finns were also neutral. After World War II, they weathered the Cold War very well. They remained more unscathed and independent than, for example, the Poles or the Hungarians, who were integrated into the Warsaw Pact. Neutrality also brought freedom to the Finns. Now it is being abandoned with the argument that Russia is so dangerous. That would mean that today's Russia is a greater or worse threat than the former Soviet Union. To me, that is absolute nonsense. But we have this discourse in Central Europe, including in Austria and Switzerland. How do you explain that this change in thinking is now taking place in many circles? Circles that say neutrality does not protect us, even though it has a clear history of generating security. Well, when things are going well, one becomes careless, then things are going too well. It's the same with environmental policy. We are doing well, the economy is flourishing and we are getting richer, at least some of us. That varies. When things are going well, one becomes overconfident. This overconfidence leads to falling back into old patterns of thinking. Conflicts are no longer resolved through negotiations, but with military force, following the motto, we are the stronger ones, we are doing so well. According to the CIPRI statistics, in 2023, America's military spending was nine times higher than Russia's. And that is just a single NATO ally. Just one, of course, the most important, but still just one. The entire security or insecurity system we currently have is more immense than ever before. Russia is at a point where we should actually be thinking about how to restore peace and reintegrate Russia. But we are doing exactly the opposite. The question on the NATO side is how to defeat Russia. There are even official considerations on how to break up Russia and divide it into several states. One wonders why the Russians feel insecure. This arrogance creates problems for us and also undermines neutrality because it contradicts this principle of hubris, the principle that we can determine where it goes. Do you see it that way too? Yes, I agree with that. I wanted to add that there was a time in Austria's history when it was unclear whether the neutrality established after the Swiss model had to be armed or if there were other possibilities. I am thinking of Immanuel Kant's thesis. As long as states are armed and have standing armies, they always pose a potential threat and thus a danger of war. In the long term, the goal should be that there are no standing armies at all. 
dass äh, überhaupt keine stehenden Heere mehr existieren. Das war der Gedanke von Immanuel Kant in Zum ewigen Frieden. That was Immanuel Kant's idea of perpetual peace, to make world peace or European peace possible. The question now is, what change in thinking has occurred? You know, I grew up after the war, so I was born during the war. When I was a child, a woman once gathered a few young boys together, all of whom were still in primary school or a little older. She then told us, yes, you know, I have to tell you what your future will be like. You have to expect that when you grow up, you will have to go to war again. That's how it is. That's completely normal. Es ist völlig normal. Und zwar, wenn die Menschen nicht in den Krieg ziehen, dann degenerieren sie. If people do not go to war, they degenerate, just like the ancient Romans. They are no longer healthy. It is natural to wage wars. We might win the next war, or maybe not. In any case, it is just the way it is. Only these priests, who have no children, think there will ever be a time of peace. That is a utopia that is not true. They may not have called it that, but I say it in my own words. According to their view, it is simply wrong and unnatural. Das heißt, das ist einfach falsch nach ihrer Auffassung. Unnatürlich und falsch. Also ich, ich sage das deshalb, weil diese Mentalität, das ist ja... Uh, I say this because this mentality is the background of National Socialism, which existed even earlier. Bertha von Suttner constantly had to deal with such thoughts. There was no Hitler for a long time. This means it is an ancient tradition that dates back to antiquity. War is considered the only way to become famous. Machiavelli, for example, says that religion is only good for ensuring that the military and police do not have to be used as much to maintain internal order, because religion takes care of that anyway. But the most important thing is that we are militarily strong, can defeat others, and become famous as a result. Eben berühmt werden. Ne? Und Österreich hatte da eine andere Idee, uh, die anderen mögen. And Austria had a different idea. Let others wage wars. You happy Austria marry. This means it is actually an old Austrian tradition not to glorify war as much as was the case in other countries. That is a peculiarity. And I believe that is also why Bertha von Suttner is an Austrian. That is why Austria ultimately, after the war, became a neutral state, because this tradition already stemmed from the monarchy, understanding between nations and peaceful coexistence. I have also seen this practiced in my family. In my family, several nations are connected Connected, including old Austrian nations. Miteinander verbunden auch. Altösterreichische Nationen. Your father is from Trieste, right? The father was born in Trieste, but is originally from Germany. His father came from Germany and his mother from Rijeka, which at that time belonged to Hungary. This, 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 die, die Komplexität Europas besteht darin, dass auf sehr engem Raum The complexity of Europe lies in the fact that, in a very small area, the second smallest continent in the world, many peoples and languages have to live closely together. European borders are constantly shifting. It is difficult to find a decade in which the borders do not change. The question is always whether they shift peacefully or through war. With the Brexit of the British, we had a peaceful change of the rules and borders of Europe. At the moment, we are witnessing a warlike change again. We experienced something similar in the 1990s with the Yugoslav Wars. We Europeans cannot escape war and the war mentality. But within this mentality, there is also room for neutrality. Neutrality has a geostrategic value to keep countries safe. My question to a neutral Austria, which is armed neutral, is, why is there now a political movement that feels safer within an alliance? Austria and Switzerland are surrounded by friends. Why would one want to join a military alliance? Warum will man sich in eine Militärallianz begeben? Das ist, uh, man baut ein Feindbild auf. Mhm. Und das Feindbild eigenartigerweise ist derzeit... An enemy image is being constructed. And this enemy image is, strangely enough, currently some say Islam, but officially primarily Russia. 
Carl Schmitt said that the friend-enemy relationship is the basis of all politics. You need an enemy, otherwise you can't come to an agreement. The enemy is what unites you, isn't it? I mean, I'm not a follower of Carl Schmitt, I'm saying that now as well. He also contributed to National Socialist thinking, although he was later interpreted differently. But I'm just saying that this is a completely different way of thinking than that of Thomas Aquinas, who emphasized the concern for commonality in politics. And that is actually based on Aristotle, theoretically, although the opinion of the philosophers back then was not identical to the practice of the states. But fundamentally, this idea that, for example, Augustine says states have a relationship with each other by nature, like the organs of a body. If they harm each other, they harm themselves, and that is to their mutual disadvantage. It would be the same with regard to states. States that attack each other also harm themselves, even if they think they have become richer through victory and spoils. For this reason, I like to compare war to cancer. Cancer destroys the body to which it clings. If the war becomes large enough, it destroys the entire body of humanity. Then there is no more war, but that leads to eternal peace through eternal death, unfortunately. The question, therefore, when we deal with war, is, how can we eliminate or contain this cancer? I see neutrality as a principle that does not eliminate war, but keeps it small enough so that it does not ruin the entire body. Mm -hmm. I am not familiar with medicine and cancer treatment. I only repeatedly experience tragic situations where despite intensive treatment, one person or another is given up and dies or dies during treatment. This shows that there are still gaps in knowledge here. Just as there is this lack of knowledge in medicine regarding cancer, unfortunately, it is also present in politics. I am convinced that Christianity has motivated the aspect of peace much more strongly than was the case in the past. With the retreat of Christianity, which is almost an official line in the EU, there is also a revival of militarism. The monotheistic religions have that in common. I find it important to emphasize that in Islam, that is in many Arab countries, and in Judaism, the greeting word used to greet each other is peace, shalom and salam alaikum. This is still an incomplete matter because it means that I make peace with you, but not with others. That is not yet a true motivation. I am currently writing a book about Jesus, and the crucial point was that Jesus not only did good, but also did not resist when he was innocently executed. This initiated an impulse. In the Roman Empire, Christians were persecuted even though they had not used violence. Nevertheless, this led to the state eventually accepting this religion and even making it the community-building religion. The non-warlike Christianity defeated the warlike Rome without weapons. Yes, but I would argue that this naturally happened when St. Augustine made the Christian religion compatible with war through the idea of a just war. In my opinion, the teachings of Jesus were made compatible with Roman ideals by integrating war, the just war, against evil enemies. Of course, one can say that there were certain compromises. When Christianity was considered the state religion, it could no longer be the case as it was before, that one could not form a state with Christians because they were against war. That was completely impossible, because how should one defend oneself without war? Thus, the logic of war was incorporated into the state religion, albeit in a weakened form. The concept of a just war does not actually originate from Christianity, but from Cicero and others. The medieval position aimed to humanize wars. 
It was only with the end of the Middle Ages that wars became brutalized. Erst mit dem Ende des Mittelalters war dann die Brutalisierung des Krieges, vor allem in der französischen Revolution bzw. mit den napoleonischen Kriegen. Especially with the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars and afterwards, there was a brutalization of war. Hitler took Napoleon as a model. At the same time, Christianity increasingly disappeared from society. I do not want to claim that Christianity could have abolished war. But the Austrian historian and medieval specialist Michael Mitterauer has explained that in no other continent during the European Middle Ages did so few wars occur. He says that the number of deaths in the wars of that time corresponds to today's number of traffic fatalities. Moreover, there were no attacks from the European side on non-European territories, but only vice versa, attacks from non-European on European states. So, you are now talking about the Middle Ages, the pre-colonial period, so roughly between 800 and 1400. That begins, at least I say, with the Napoleonic Wars. But the beginning of modern warfare also falls into the time of the Napoleonic Wars. Then suddenly there was a wave of war enthusiasm and war brutalization. Napoleon had to be repelled. As a result, the Prussians introduced universal conscription and discipline. This later led to Hitler and so on. So there was an escalation. After the Second World War, it was thought that this matter had really been taken to the extreme. It must also be said that Bertha von Suttner educated Nobel to be a quasi-pacifist. Nobel was not only the heir of weapons factories, but also worked partially for warfare with his own inventions. She then said that his view was, if the weapons are particularly brutal, people will be reasonable and never use these brutal weapons. Then peace will come. But the opposite has happened. The wars have become all the more brutal. And that is the problem. Today, we are of the opinion that we must be as brutal as possible, cause as much damage as possible, wage wars, kill people, and destroy countries. Then the peace we want will finally come. This is the dictum of Mr. Stoltenberg, who literally said two years ago that weapons are the way to peace. This is repeatedly sold to us. We Europeans are repeatedly told that we must go to war to end the war. It was the same during the First World War. There were also very brutal periods before the Napoleonic Wars, the Thirty Years War, which ended in 1648, and also the Crusades were extremely brutal and terrible. But what can be done to counter this? In the historical historiography of Islamic countries, the so-called Frankish wars play only a minor role. This means that we ourselves have a guilty conscience, but the Arab countries see it as a minor issue. And ultimately, it all belongs together. The interesting thing about Europe is that it always views itself as separate from Arabia and Asia, even though they belong together as a landmass. The last ones who managed to get close to Vienna were the Mongols, who invaded 800 years ago. And we just tend to forget them in between. But the question still remains, how do we pacify this large continent? How do we pacify such a large area with so many people and so much potential for self-destruction, which we are currently doing again? We are once again engaging in something very European, namely harming ourselves. Well, I thought one should propose Pope Francis for the Nobel Peace Prize. He constantly speaks against the European zeitgeist and is partly criticized for it, yet still taken seriously. I think this could strengthen the idea of focusing on negotiated peace rather than victory peace. He constantly moves along this line. The question repeatedly arises whether he might be speaking too much against the West or too much as a supporter of Putin.
When he talks about negotiations now, people think you can't negotiate with him. You mustn't do that. When he talks about negotiations now, people think you can't negotiate with him. You mustn't do that. When he talks about negotiations now, people think you can't negotiate with him. You mustn't do that even the Pope was extremely criticized by the Northern European side when he suggested it. I wonder how we can move away from this ideologization. From the perspective of peace, this position should be strengthened. And we agree on that. There are many people, also in Switzerland and Austria, who believe that you cannot talk to Putin and that he only understands weapons. This actually contradicts everything we have seen in the last 20 years, with all the negotiations and diplomatic efforts that have taken place, including the Minsk agreements. My analysis is that we Europeans currently believe in a false image of the enemy. Therefore, the question arises, how can we return from Russians are the enemy to Russians are the partner? How do we get back there? At that time, I was against the founding of the European Union. Not because I was against international understanding. In my youth, I was active in the European Federalist Movement. But that is something different from the unification that came with the founding of the European Union. The state loses its sovereignty. Legislation often no longer occurs democratically. It is determined by people who are not elected but appointed. The laws are then just rushed through the parliament. That is no longer what used to be called democracy. And I also want to say something that I mention in my lectures. There is no better definition than the one Jesus gave. The definition by Abraham Lincoln, which is often quoted, is actually a tautology. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. When subject and object are identical, it is a tautology. But when Jesus says the rulers of this world oppress their people and may even call themselves benefactors of the people, it should be different among you. Whoever wants to be first among you should serve the others. Is there a better definition of democracy? I know of none. We need to strengthen that again. The servants of the people, and also the power of the people. There were people who called themselves servants of the people. But it doesn't matter what they call themselves. What matters is that schools teach what education one has and how one can serve the people. How can one contribute to society? Today, however, the question often asked is how to climb the ladder and earn a lot of money. The world cannot function like this. The incredible thing about the current situation is not only the war that continues to spread, it is also the development of the definition of democracy in democratic states. This definition often has little to do with true democracy. There is much talk about the need to defend democracy. Therefore, the population should be protected from evil thoughts and fake news. But that is only a small step away from someone saying, I am the democracy. Similar to how the French king once said, I am the state. We are only one step away from a small oligarchic group claiming, we are the democracy. The essence of democracy, as Ernst Frankel, a significant mentor of political science in Germany said, is not a single institution like the parliament or the constitutional court but the free formation of opinion and will from the bottom up. And that is not working today. The laws are enforced from the top down. Where was the Austrian parliamentary resolution that demanded the introduction of marriage for all? It was dictated from above, and the others have to follow.
Und genau an dem Punkt müsste man eigentlich in allen äh, modernen Demokratien... And precisely at this point, more direct democracy should be introduced in all modern democracies, and more referendums should be enabled. Fortunately, Switzerland does this. There we can vote on two to three laws four times a year, with a yes or no. This creates a completely different political dynamic. Another important aspect of democracy that I would like to add is the separation of powers. This must function extremely well. However, we see a tendency towards centralization of decision-making power, both in America and in Germany. The government drives the parliament ahead of it, and the electorate is only consulted every four years. This is measured in advance with election barometers, so there is very little influence left. Of course, peace and democracy are connected, but not in the way people like to say, we must wage war to expand democracy. Peace is neglected in that view. You are absolutely right. This is one of those fallacies that exist today. I believe first and foremost, it is about people simply having it too good. They always want more. This mentality is ruining the world, democracy, and ultimately ourselves. Diseases of affluence occur, and so on. This is a general issue. I hope there will be an improvement, in whatever way. Maybe a few people listening now will say, yes, we are starting anew on our own. Perhaps then there will be a change in the climate in Europe. Ultimately, change must come from the bottom if we advocate for the state to be shaped from the bottom up. It is therefore in the hands of each individual to decide whether to refuse or to work in this direction. If enough people come together, change might be achievable. So our question is, how do we gain more friends for our circle? Yes, the question needs to be clarified even better in the future because time is pressing. It is like this. Professor Bader, people who want to read more from you should best visit your homepage. I will link the homepage below in the description so that more can be read from you. Professor Bader, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much for the interview. It was a pleasure. Goodbye. If you value our translations, please consider supporting us on Patreon. The link is in the description. Thank you very much.